in a world full of reboots, sequels, and prequels. You might be forgiven for thinking that Web 3 was simply a rehashed version of Web's 1 and 2, only with an even faker shark, a lame script, and stars only in it for the ding, 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 ka-ching. But that couldn't be further off the mark. Web 3 ushers in the era of your personal digital freedom. But freedom from what, though, you ask? Well, that is what we're here to turn our BD the spectacled eye upon. Welcome to School of Block. All right, chill out. Before we get too excited about the potential of Web3, and trust me, there is some serious potential here, let's do a quick recap of what the hell Webs 1 and 2 actually were. Web 1, or 1.0, I don't quite know why we need the decimal. It sort of sounds cooler though, doesn't it? Well, that refers to the first stage of the World Wide Web from the mid-90s onwards. And there were just a few content creators putting up websites consisting mostly of static pages. Web 1.0 was essentially just an information portal where users passively received content without the opportunity to get involved themselves. Read only, if you like. Speed of access was a big issue, with websites being designed to be as light on kilobytes as possible so as not to detonate dial-up modem's poultry bandwidth. And as a consequence, Web 1.0 barely even had much in the way of images, with much of the content being text-based. But even so, Web 1.0 fundamentally changed the world. Suddenly, we had a globally accessible, free-to-access hub of information. No central authority, censorship, or surveillance. Search engines like Webcrawler and AltaVista played a huge role in helping users navigate the space. Now we covered Tim Berners-Lee's revolutionary vision for the internet back in episode 5, and Web 1.0 got all of that off to a flying start. The potential for the internet was quickly grasped by startup minnows as well as software whales like Microsoft, and the dot-com boom in the late 90s reflected investors' awareness that the web was in the process of completely changing the world we lived in. So that's Web 1.0, and we can define that as freedom of information. So what about Web 2.0? Well, you see, the seed was planted back in 1997 with the very first social network, Six Degrees. It enabled users to upload a profile and make friends with other users. The noughties was where social media really kicked off though. Friendster in 2002, quickly followed by MySpace, Facebook, and Twitter, all by 2006. Mmm, friends. But I just don't have any room in my life for a new friend. What made social media different to what had gone before? Well, as Tim Berners-Lee put it, the paradigm had gone from read only to read right. Now the web was somewhere that users generated the content, interacting and collaborating with each other. You're presenting is more disappointing. And arguing than too, to of course. Okay, you're used you what? stupid. You're just boring. If, there, if your brain was ah, get out. YouTube enabled users to create and share video as well as monetize it, while Instagram changed from being a photo filter app to well, kind of what Facebook used to be. And what else changed in this epoch? Well, mobile internet and smartphones enabled users to access and generate content in entirely new ways. Twitter thrived from these developments, changing the very face of news by moving more quickly than any TV network could hope, could hope to. What's this? Oh, come on. I'm trending on Twitter. I did. Yeah, I, I, just, I'm, I, I need to sit, yeah. And how has Web 2.0 influenced society? Well, how long have you got? This could be an hour-long film on that topic alone, but imagine the Arab Spring taking place without the people on the streets reporting what was in front of them and sharing it with their peers. Imagine a world where good science is shared equitably without misinformation in the face of a global pandemic. And imagine a world where shady companies <coughs> don't receive mysterious funding, collect data on users' preferences, and then tailor fake news to what's most likely to change their voting habits. These nameless social networks have become essentially digital monopolies, acting as a middleman and leveraging people's assets and data to generate profits, generating profits from you. Now remember, if you're not paying for the product, 
You are the product. The Web 3.0 promises to be as disruptive to that model as the social media giants were to teenagers' social habits. So whether you think it's good or bad, Web 2.0 has undeniably revolutionized the way we live, shop, socialize, date, and play. And if we can define Web 1.0 by freedom of information, then Web 2.0 is freedom of expression. But what about Web 3.0? Google it and you will find articles from 2008 arguing the Web 3.0 will be defined by computers interpreting information like humans and intelligently directing tailored content back to users. Sound familiar? Well, yes, of course, because with every targeted advert that's desperate for your eyeballs, well, yeah, we've been seeing this for some time already. But it's not surprising that these early articles didn't really capture the full potential of Web 3.0, because the seed that was going to define that potential had only just been planted, and yes, that seed was, of course, Satoshi Nakamoto's white paper for Bitcoin. And that's because Web 3.0 is now defined by digital ownership, and not just ownership of money, your finances free from any central authority or permission, but ownership of your actual digital self, your digital art, your applications, your devices, every touch point you have in your digital life. And how does this work? Well, imagine if you had ownership of every single post you made on social media and were rewarded for the engagement it generated. Now, that data, that content is yours, it's owned by you, not some social media company. If it's not on some mega company servers, well then where does it live? And how is it tracked? Well, of course, on the blockchain where, cryptographically secured, it will allow direct peer-to-peer -peer transactions with no social media giant or middleman to broker the process. In episode six, we talk about this in depth, but in the context of web three versus web two, we can consider this a definite upgrade. The arrival of decentralized finance has meant that you don't need a bank to earn interest on your money. And if you want to dabble in art, then the world of NFTs is opening up at an alarming rate too. What's an NFT, you ask? Well, it stands for non-fungible token and is essentially a one-off digital token whose provenance is verifiable and as such has value. How much value? Well, that depends on the market, but right now, potentially quite a lot. But an NFT isn't necessarily just artwork. It could be an in-game skin for a character or your avatar or a piece of digital art or land, some other digital item that can be used in multiple digital realms. Now imagine the frustration of spending too much money or any money really on skins and collectibles in Fortnite or FIFA, but without being able to resell or use them anywhere else. In five years, maybe your character in Fortnite can wear your messy Barcelona shirt from FIFA. Who knows, the technology is certainly there already. So an NFT is really just a one-off thing. In the same way, every item you encounter in real life, bar money or liquid, is a unique item in its own right. This is the physical world made digital. Web 3.0 will also usher in the era of decentralized applications or dApps. Run by the community on a peer-to-peer -peer network, their open source nature completely cuts out the corporations and developers who currently furtively collect your data. Now, one consequence of digital ownership is personal responsibility and custody. In this world, you are responsible for your own assets. If you send your Bitcoin somewhere you shouldn't, you can't just call the bank. If you lose the private keys for your digital world, well, do you know what? You might be in a bit of a jam. And yes, I do keep jam in my back pocket. So, if Web 1.0 was freedom of information and Web 2.0 freedom of expression, we can see Web 3.0 as digital freedom. You own and control your assets in the digital space the same way you wear clothes or store your car key. This is the movement from an internet of information to an internet of value. But each of us are able to control the value of our digital presence online in whatever form we choose. The potential of this is clearly huge. And we don't know yet just quite what the societal, technological and political impacts will be in the same way that Mark Zucky Zucky Zuckerberg probably wasn't thinking about his responsibility in global democracy when he was starting out stalking sororities at Harvard. Sorry, Mark, don't sue me. 
But one thing's for sure, your digital freedom is coming from banks, from big tech, and big... pants? Well, everything else. And we're here to help you make the most of it. So that's it for this week. Next week, we're going to be talking about all the different types of coins. They are not all trying to be money, you know. You've been watching School of Block Demystifying Decentralization one block at a time. Don't forget to get subscribed, drop us a like if that's what you're into. And until next time, to your financial freedom. Oh yeah.